On this Thursday night, an unwelcome surprise at the pumps. Millions of drivers face an overnight spike in gas prices. It's like we're trapped. And it's disgusting what the oil companies are doing. In Ontario, First Nation facing a possible environmental emergency. We can't even trust the people who are supposed to be regulating these things. How a First Nation says a reported spike in pollutants from nearby chemical plants is making them sick. Plus, readying to reload. An inside look at an American plant making artillery shells for Ukraine. And arrests in a possible plot to assassinate Ukraine's president. Plus, Banksy's work unveiled. Would the anonymous anti-establishment artist endorse this, making its Canadian debut? Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. A lot of people who needed to fill up their gas tank got a bit of a shock today. Prices in some places in Canada jumped overnight. The price for a regular litre of gas went up as much as 22 cents in parts of Ontario and Quebec, reaching a two-year high in those provinces. There's never a straightforward explanation for why gas prices fluctuate so wildly. It's partly the price of oil, partly supply and demand, and partly seasonal. And today, Ontario's Premier also pointed the finger at oil and gas companies. Heidi Petrachik has our top story tonight. Call it major sticker shock. I think it was a bit too, too much in one, in one shot. Everything high. Too high. Throughout Ontario and Quebec, the price of today's gas is higher than it was Wednesday by as much as 22 cents. The reason, experts say, isn't the controversial carbon tax, but the change of season. The supplies of winter gasoline had been very high. Uh, now that we've liquidated that, going to a blend of gasoline that's very tight on supply, that's where this jolt is originating from. Stations are required to switch to summer blended fuel, which helps lower emissions. It's disgusting what the oil companies are doing. Do you let your tanks at the gas station drain or using the old gas and charging the higher cost? Whatever it is, these prices haven't been seen since August 2022, reaching more than a dollar eighty at some Toronto pumps and past a dollar ninety one in Montreal. Newfoundlanders and Labradorians are also paying more, roughly one ninety three per liter in St. John's after a three and a half cent hike. Prices on the West Coast already at two dollars and ten cents. In the struggle to make ends meet, some are considering alternatives. Park your car, carpools and everything, especially carpools, yeah. I'd like to see uh, more public transportation. A noteworthy. Steve McKay, Halifax's bike mayor wants more people to think beyond the pumps. See if you can replace a couple of drives every week with a bike ride or a walk. Drivers in the three maritime provinces are now anxiously waiting to find out if they'll pay more when prices are adjusted on Friday. Some analysts predict things will stabilize in the near future, but prices could go up again with summertime demand. Heidi Petrachik, Global News, Halifax. There are concerns an environmental emergency may be unfolding in a small First Nation in southwestern Ontario. Dozens of people there are reporting they got sick after high levels of benzene, a cancer-causing chemical, were detected. Omjanong First Nation lies in what's called Chemical Valley on the south side of Sarnia, Ontario. The community is surrounded by dozens of large petrochemical plants within a 25 kilometer radius. The First Nation has long been exposed to high levels of dangerous pollutants. Now a new spike is stoking anger and fear and the First Nation has called an urgent meeting tonight. Our chief investigative correspondent Carolyn Jarvis has been following the story from the beginning and reports on the calls for a plant to be shut down. It's not okay. None of it's okay. Christine Rogers was at work on Tuesday. Her office located only meters from a chemical plant when she says her head started pounding and she developed flu-like symptoms. And I um, told work that I'd be going home for the afternoon because I wasn't feeling well. Soon after, her father called. He had been working outside just down the street and said he wasn't feeling well either. It was more like tingly and then, yeah, I was getting sick. They say an ambulance took them, along with Christine's daughter, to hospital. Only minutes later, an alert from the First Nation was issued, warning of extremely high benzene levels and suggesting all staff leave their buildings and work from home. Benzene is a cancer-causing chemical. 
and the levels recorded right outside the band office were skyrocketing. In fact, according to an analysis by Global News, there had been large spikes in benzene for more than two weeks. In Ontario, the annual average limit for benzene is 0.45 micrograms per cubic meter. There is no hourly limit. But on April 1st, the air monitor in North Amgenang picked up hourly readings of nearly 140 micrograms. There were more spikes on the 5th and 6th, even reaching 150 on the 14th. And early on the 16th, the day so many reported feeling sick, the level hit 115. Sage Hallett Plain was among them, 30 weeks pregnant and now afraid to breathe in the air in her First Nation. I don't know what's happening to my baby and I don't know if she could be safe or even if after she's born, if there could be difficulties. There are many sources of benzene in the area, but the most direct and arguably the most significant is the chemical plant right across the street from Amgenang, Ineos Styrolution. In the last few weeks in particular, like I said, we've gone from probably 100 times uh, what you'd see in other communities to 300 times. Amgenang's ban council is now calling for the government to immediately shut down Ineos until it can operate safely. Ineos did not respond to our requests for an interview, but in a statement said it upholds stringent environmental and safety protocols to meet all regulated standards, and that it's reviewing this data and any concerns from the community. Make no mistake, when it comes to protecting health and safety, we will not hesitate to use our strong regulatory tools and enforce actions to hold emitters to account. But the people of Amgenang don't buy it. I have no desire to ever return back to my office and be exposed to who knows what because they are not properly monitoring what's going on. Carolyn Jarvis, Global News, Toronto. Tomorrow, Carolyn looks at what's being done to address concerns about dangerously high levels of benzene. The U.S. and U.K. have announced new sanctions against Iran in retaliation for its recent aerial attack against Israel. The U.S. sanctions target Iranian steel production and Iran's drone production. They are intended to degrade and disrupt the weapons used to target civilians in Israel. The British measures also target several Iranian military organizations as well as Iran's ballistic missile industries. Ninety-nine percent of the 300 drones and missiles Iran fired at Israel were shot down. Global Affairs says Canada is exploring additional sanctions and is working with its G7 partners on what it calls a coordinated and comprehensive response to Iran. A Polish man has been arrested, charged with planning to cooperate with Russian intelligence services to aid a possible assassination of Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky. Polish prosecutors say the man was arrested Wednesday on suspicion of being ready to spy on Zelensky on behalf of Russia's military intelligence. The man is accused of preparing to pass on detailed security information to Russian agents about an airport in southeastern Poland near Ukraine's border, an airport used by Zelensky. In the U.S., lawmakers are now edging closer to a critical vote on whether to give billions of dollars in military aid to Ukraine. Some Republicans have blocked that funding despite warnings that without American support, Ukraine could lose its fight against Russia. The aid includes tens of thousands of rounds of American artillery shells desperately needed on the front lines. Jackson Prosco was given rare access to a U.S. Army plant that produces those shells where officials warn without funding they can't fulfill a critical contract. This is an unlikely front in Ukraine's war. The U.S. Army's ammunition plant in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Here, American workers produce 155 millimeter artillery shells that are loaded with explosives and shipped 8,000 kilometers away, where they're fired by Ukrainian troops to fend off Russia's invasion. So right now we're contracted to produce 24,000 rounds a month. We were invited to tour the sprawling facility to see superheated steel forged into lethal weapons. Shell is operating at near 1900 degrees. No one here will mention Ukraine specifically. The army will only talk about fulfilling what it calls the contract. Workers know lives and perhaps the fate of an entire nation rest on what they do here. The need for these shells has never been greater. 
Estimates are that for every one cell produced by the U.S. and its allies, Russia is producing three. That urgency has not been felt in Washington, where Republicans have for months blocked billions in additional military aid to Ukraine. And so the shells are now piling up on American soil, leaving the Ukrainian army desperately short of ammunition, allowing Russia to make gains. Delays in delivery of ammunition will allow Russia to press along the front line. Ukraine uh, simply cannot wait. As Washington stalls, Scranton soldiers on. We're taking advantage of modern technology to become as efficient as we can be. The plant is undergoing nearly half a billion dollars worth of upgrades to quadruple production in light of current global conflicts. The target for completing the majority of this work is either late next year or early 26. And how much capacity will there be when you meet that target? There'll be more. Whether this modern mobilization can save Ukraine depends on whether America finds the money and the will to resume shipments. Consistency and predictability and funding going forward, you know, into the next several years is extremely important. This plant is ready to keep up the fight. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Scranton, Pennsylvania. Twelve jurors, seven men and five women have now been selected in the trial of former U.S. President Donald Trump. This after two jurors were excused from duty earlier today. One of them told the court she felt intimidated after media reports revealed details about her and her friends and family deduced she was on the jury. The other juror was dismissed over whether he'd been truthful about his criminal history. The judge reprimanded reporters for revealing too much about prospective jurors and ordered information about where they work to be redacted. Trump faces 34 counts of falsifying business records related to hush money payments to adult film star Stormy Daniels. Several alternate jurors still need to be chosen. The Arizona Coyotes are officially headed to Salt Lake City, Utah. The NHL Board of Governors voted unanimously to approve the $1.2 billion sale to the owners of the Utah Jazz. Yeah, a lot of people in the stands don't really want to get out of here and see this go away. The Coyotes won what turned out to be their final game in Arizona last night. The team has been plagued with unstable ownership, bankruptcy and arena problems throughout its 28 years in Arizona. The NHL is giving the Coyotes' former owner a five-year window to find a new home for a future franchise. A portrait of suffering. Coming up, the award-winning photo capturing life and death in Gaza. <laughs> 11,000 people have been ordered to leave a remote Indonesian island after multiple volcanic eruptions triggered a tsunami warning. Mount Ruang has erupted at least five times since Tuesday, sending thick ash clouds 3,000 meters into the sky. There are fears the volcano could partially collapse into the sea. A U.N. Security Council resolution that would have extended full member status to a Palestinian state has been vetoed by the United States. The final vote was 12 in favor, one against. Two countries, the U.K. and Switzerland, abstained. The result effectively blocks the world body from recognizing a Palestinian state. U.S. officials had warned other countries that voting for statehood now would undermine efforts at a lasting peace between Israel and the Palestinians. The Biden administration had lobbied many of the 15 Security Council members to join it in rejecting the measure. A Reuters photojournalist is among four winners of one of the world's prestigious photo competitions. Mohammed Salem is his name. He's Palestinian, and his photo captured a moment of loss and heartbreak. This is the World Press Photo of the Year, a grieving woman holding the body of her five-year-old niece. It was taken 10 days after the start of Israel's siege on Gaza. As Nithu Garcha reports, there are hopes the photo will have an impact. These two 10-year-old boys survey the wreckage of their destroyed school. And amidst these ruins of war, a single image has captured global attention. A haunting photograph of a grieving Palestinian woman cradling the lifeless body of her five-year-old niece, killed in an Israeli strike. It has been awarded the 2024 World Press Photo of the Year. Every single house has the same picture. The poignant moment captured by Reuters photographer Mohammed Salim. His fellow journalist and neighbor hopes it leads to more international pressure for a ceasefire. And we hope that international community uh, uh, complete uh, support Palestinian 
rights uh, to have their state and recognize uh, as uh, recognized Palestine as a state in the United Nations. This image by another journalist in Gaza, which won in the Pictures of the Year Asia competition, captures a hauntingly similar scene. An anguished woman carries the corpse of her sister, killed in an Israeli strike. In an interview for Global News, the photographer said, I am a journalist, and every second of my life is a film of horror and fear, and I put my life in danger in order to resist and spread the truth. Salem posted a similar message on Facebook to say he's dedicating his award to journalists in Gaza who paid the ultimate price for truth and honored the memory of his own brother, a director with the House of Press Foundation, and that he hopes this picture reaches the whole world and will be a reason to stop the war. Neetu Garcha, Global News, Vancouver. Ahead, what you need to know about the changes to capital gains tax. Big changes are coming to capital gains tax in Canada. It's part of the government's plan to generate revenue to help pay for its $53 billion in new spending. The aim is to target Canada's wealthiest, but some middle-class Canadians who own small businesses, such as family doctors or people who are selling a second property like a cottage, might have to pay more too. Eric Sorensen looks at the changes and how they might affect you. The vast majority of Canadians as individuals do not pay capital gains. But many who do feel blindsided by higher taxes on future retirement incomes, on small businesses to be sold or passed on eventually, or on other investments. We don't get pensions, we don't get retirement funds, we don't get insurance or sick days. We have to save up for our own retirement and for our own families. David Poon is a family doctor and says his professional corporation will be hit hard. While capital gains of $300,000 for individuals will see the tax rate rise from 50 to 67 percent on just 50,000 of that amount, resulting in some $4,500 in additional income tax owing, it's steeper for professional corporations, even medium-sized. The capital gains on $300,000, the taxable portion increases to 67 percent on the entire amount, resulting in more than $25,000 in additional corporate taxes. This is essentially a retroactive tax on our savings. This is an affront to doctors. It is grossly inappropriate to lump us in with these ultra wealthy. Anytime the government increases taxes, someone somewhere is going to be paying more. Economist Trevor Toome says the government is making changes to the tax structure, but it's also raising revenue and higher taxes will hit some harder than others. Any kind of prior financial arrangements that people undertook take advantage of the fact that capital gains were preferentially treated, yeah, no, those arrangements aren't as attractive anymore. Changes are coming to other assets, like a cottage and other second properties. If the value of a cottage has increased tenfold from 100000 to a $1 million over time, when it's passed on, it could hit the family with another $50,000 or more of capital gains taxes on top of what they'd planned for. The increased tax hit um, will definitely exist and will need to be funded. And if, if there are not enough other assets in the estate, the cottage might very well need to be sold just because of the increased tax. In other words, more Canadians may find it harder to see their grandparents' cottage stay in the family. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. Art meets activism next. A touring exhibit of Banksy's best works comes to Canada. Banksy is probably the best known living artist who you've never seen. He's from the UK and his subversive murals and installations are famous, but he's carefully kept his identity secret for years and he shuns all public attention. And so a traveling exhibit of his work seems almost counterintuitive. Yet as Mike Jarlet reports, an exhibit of some of Banksy's best art is set to open in Ontario. Most of my work is temporary. It's fair to say Banksy would probably hate this, all of it. As a subversive anti-establishment, anti-capitalist graffiti artist, it would be more shocking if he supported this touring exhibit of his work currently in London, Ontario. Banksy's evolution as an artist is remarkable. He learned early on that he had to adapt to survive and avoid getting nabbed by the cops. So what would take hours to accomplish freehand with stencils, he was able to do in minutes. And what he figured out in that genius moment changed the way we look at art. In essence, 
turning it on its head. And he did it despite nobody really knowing who he is. There's been speculation, but nothing has been proven. This is Banksy, yeah? Yeah. In the David Bowie uh, reinterpretation. Romanian yeah. show producer Serena yeah. Borlaku uh, knows people who know him, but that's but, uh, it. And she now believes Banksy is less of a person than a collective. Yeah, but it's a head, it's a brain that has best the best ideas in the world. Over the years, Banksy has created works in Ukraine, on the wall separating Israel from the West Bank and all over England, using his distinct style to poke authority in the eye. When one of his works sold at auction for $1.9 million, he had a surprise. It automatically started shredding in front of a stunned crowd. And the shredded version later sold for $34 million. Unfortunately, what happens for Banksy is every time he does something controversial, it kind of goes against what he's trying to do and might, you know, uh, double or triple or 20 times the amount of value uh, of, of the art. So now, when a Banksy piece shows up on a building like this one depicting urban tree foliage in London, England, barricades go up to protect it. Has he become too big to still be the street artist Banksy? Maybe. Perhaps he should just show up at an exhibit of his work and say hi. Mike Trillet, Global News, London, Ontario. That'll never happen. That is Global National for this Thursday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is Port de Grave, Newfoundland and Labrador. We'd love to see Your Canada. Please email it to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Farah Nasser will be at the Anchor Desk tomorrow and I'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.